Hey friends, it is Jenna What Is Up and welcome back to the Board Game Garden and welcome to a preview of this game right here. This is Citizens of the Spark. It is the next game coming to you by Thunderworks Games who is sponsoring today's video. So a huge thank you to them. And it's designed by Philip Dubarry. And this is a card based game. It plays one to five players. So it does have a solo mode, big thumbs up here in the board game garden. It plays in about 45 to 60 minutes and it is 14 plus. When you are watching this video, the campaign has started. So I will leave a link down in the description box if you guys want to go and check it out. I will be going over an aim of the game, components, as well as how the game plays. So you guys can get a feel if it's something that you would enjoy and you are interested in backing over there. Um, but yeah, without further ado, let's get into this. If you want to see exactly how Citizens of the Spark plays, then just keep on watching. Give this video a big thumbs up if you enjoy. Also hit the subscribe button down below if you've yet to do so. We'd love to have you here in the garden. Comment down below if Citizens of the Spark is something that you are interested in. And without further ado, let's get into this preview of Citizens of the Spark, shall we? So quickly before we get into an aim of the game and the gameplay itself, I do want to quickly kind of explain the story behind Citizens of the Spark because I think it's a very cool story. Um, basically what has happened is there is an undeveloped planet called Fera, and what has happened is some sort of cosmic signal or something has washed over the planet and it actually allowed for the animals on Farah to become very intelligent and discover technological advancements and all of these things. So the animals are quite far along, unlike other animals on other planets. And that whole event that has happened, they have called the transmission and some time has gone on and basically the scholars of Farah have discovered that there can only actually be one city or one settlement that can rise to the top and the rest of them are going to crumble and diminish. And basically each player in the game is going to be playing as one of those cities or one of those settlements that are trying to rise to the top and become the like shining jewel of Farah, And unfortunately, all other players, cities or settlements will fall and crumble to dust, and then all of their people will be scattered. So you are trying to, in the game, have the most spark at the end of the game, that is the currency, and what you are gaining by playing these different cards out and following these different actions, which I'll get into exactly how the game plays. But like I said, this is a card game. In the game, there are actually a bunch of different animals or citizen cards that you can pick and choose from. There are actually 30 different types of citizen cards. And depending on player count, you are going to put in seven to 10 of those different citizen cards, shuffle those up, and you actually get these different like randomizer cards. So there's going to be one card for each of the citizen cards that then you're going to be able to either pick and choose the ones that you want to play with or you can actually randomize them or also in the rule book at the back it actually tells you a set of citizen cards to use for specific types of gameplay. So if you're looking for a shorter game, it tells you kind of a mix of cards to use for that. A game that has more interaction, a game that has less interaction, a game that is strategic or a game that is tactical. So there's a bunch of different kind of sets of cards that you can use. And then like I said, you can just, if you want, completely randomize them and kind of make these really cool um, combinations of these citizen cards. So uh, yes, I think that is everything for a little bit of an aim of the game. I do want to quickly get into the components. The main thing in this game is the cards. So like I said, for this game, I have a four player game set up. There are two cards there, but you guys cannot see them. So we have four players here. And with a four player game, you are choosing, I believe nine different citizen cards. You're gonna take all of the citizen cards of each of those. So each citizen card has 10 kind of copies of that card. So there are, you know, 10 bandits, there's 10 warriors, there's 10 scouts, so on and so forth. You're gonna take all the ones that you want, the ones that I chose for this example here, are the ones that they recommend for your first game. So I've taken all of those cards, I've shuffled them into this starting pile here, or this deck here, and then each player is going to get 
four cards. In the first game, they just recommend giving each player two cards, but in subsequent games where you know a little bit more about how the game plays, you actually get four cards, you get to choose two to keep, and then the other two get discarded. Um, also, additionally, we have the first player marker here. It has a hair on it. <laughs> um, each player does get a little um, how to play player aid here. So it has how to play on one side and then it has all of the icons as well as final scoring. So that's really nice to have there. Like I've already pointed out, we have all of the kind of randomizer cards. So if you do want to randomize what cards you have, you can just shuffle those up draw seven to ten of those and those are going to be the cards that you play with. Um, I did want to have this in the shot because I think this is an amazing way to um, organize all of the cards. So all of the different um, citizen cards are organized with these little tabs here so that's really nice. And then over here on this side we have the components for the solo mode. I am very excited to play the solo mode for this one. And then we also have the sparks which are the main kind of um, victory points for this game. Ultimately the person with the most sparks at the end of the game is going to be the winner. So we have some cubes to represent some sparks. So there is the smaller clear sparkly cube, which is one spark. We have the slightly larger um, blue sparkly cube, which is five sparks. And you have tokens for 10 sparks as well as 25 sparks. So you're going to be collecting those throughout the game. And then whoever has the most at the end, like I said, will be the winner. I do also want to point out that I literally have sparks on my sweater. So I picked the best sweater for this video and I'm really, really happy about it. Anyways, if you guys want to see exactly how this game plays, that's the next thing I'm going to get into. So let's get into that. So getting into exactly how Citizens of the Spark is played, quickly before we get into the gameplay, I do want to kind of go over the card here. So each card is going to have the same kind of layout. So at the top, in the top left-hand corner, is always going to be what that specific card is. So this one here is a scout. You're gonna have the art in or on the card in the center. And then in the top right hand corner is going to be the guild that is connected to that card. The only kind of purpose for this is that some cards are going to score based off of that icon in like someone's city or in your city yourself, different things like that. So there are five different guilds. There is the agriculture guild, which is this yellow one here. There is military, which is the red. The gray is economics. There is also arts, which is the blue. And then there is green, which I do believe there's no green in this kind of set here, but that one is politics. So there are five different guilds and then there will be an icon that is all of the guilds. So that would be any guild. And then lastly, for the card layout, you have all of the information at the bottom, which is the most important part of the card. And these are going to be the different actions and abilities that each of these different citizens have. So some citizens will just have one, some of them will have two, and then each of them are going to have a kind of three different sections at the bottom of the card. Um, that is basically level one, two, and three, and I will get into the different levels and how those come into play with the um, gameplay, but yes, each of them are going to have those. There are various kind of icons that you're going to see. There are going to be attacks, which are going to be actions that you can take um, towards other players. There's going to be reaction, abilities that then if someone attacks you, that action will be activated. Um, you also have ongoing abilities, you have end game abilities, as well as you have when played abilities. So yes, that is everything for the cards there, but let's get into exactly how a turn is played. All right, so once a first player has been decided um, in this situation, that is me, I will then start my first turn. And the first thing that's going to happen on my turn is I am going to attract citizens. And this is going to be with this center area here. This is called the assembly. And this is going to be a different size depending on player count. So sometimes it will be two per row. And in this situation with a four player game, it's going to be three per row. And what you're going to do is you're going to draft one of the three rows. So I might decide to draft the three in the top, the three in the middle, or the three at the bottom. And the two cards that I have here are the warrior and the bandit. So maybe I decide I am going to draft 
the middle row. So I'm gonna take all three of the cards in the middle row and these cards will then be added to my city. If I have no card of that type of citizen already, that is going to start a new kind of column. I don't have any scouts yet, so I'm going to place that into a new column. And then the warrior here, I actually do already have one of these. So this will be added into the column with that other warrior. And when you start getting multiples of these different citizens, that is when the level of the action is going to come into play. So depending on how many cards of a certain citizen you have, that is going to determine the level of your action when you perform an action. So in this situation, we have one scientist, two warriors, one bandit, and one scout. So if I decide to do the warrior ability, I will actually do the warrior ability at level two or strength of two. So that would be everything for the attracting citizen part of my turn. I would draft one of the rows, place those cards into my city, and then we would move on to performing an action, which is, I will say, optional. So you can do this or you don't have to do this. So if I decided to perform an action, what I would first do is I would decide which one of my citizens I wanted to use to perform an action. So I could decide, let's just say, I might want to use my scout. So I would actually take my scout and place it up top of my city to let everyone know that this is the card that I am performing the ability with or performing the action with. Um, because that's very important because players can then follow, which I will get into. But with the scout here, it says gain three sparks. So I would gain three sparks into my city. And then it also says place one, two, or three into my city from the deck, depending on the level of that action. So because I only have one scout in my city, that means that I only have it at a level one. So I would simply just take one card from the deck, flip it over, and then I would place that into my city. Now, if I had more scouts in my city, let's just say I had two other scouts, that would actually be at a level three because it would count the one card that I'm using to perform the action plus the other two that I had in my city. So I would be able to perform the scout action at level three. So that would mean that I would actually take three cards from the deck and place all three of them into my city. So once I was finished taking the action with the scout, like I said, each player will then have the opportunity to follow. The only way that they can follow though is if they have at least one of the scout cards in their city. So going in turn order, each player would have the opportunity to follow with their scout card. So this player here might actually decide, hey, I am going to follow. I am going to also play my scout card here. That player would then, just like me, get three sparks into their city. And then because they only had one scout card as well, they would also take one card off the top and add that into their city. Moving on to this player, this player does not have a scout card and this player does not either. So that would then end my turn. I would have to discard this scout card. So that would go into a discard pile. This player would also have to discard that as well. And then we would replenish the cards here. We'd put those there. Actually, before we did that, we would put a spark onto each of the rows that didn't get drafted. So this kind of gives you a little bit of motivation to maybe draft one of these two now because when you draft this row or this row, you would gain that spark as well. Once all that cleanup was complete from my turn, we would then move on to the next player in turn order. They would again draft one of the three rows, place it into their city, decide if they want to perform an action. Then any players can follow if they would like. You do a few cleanup things and then it would go on to the next player. That would continue turn by turn by turn until the deck actually runs out. Once it runs out, you reshuffle the discard pile and then each player that hadn't got a turn that round, so all the way up to the person to the right of the first player, will get a turn so that every player has the same amount of turns. And then you would go into some final scoring. So the first thing that is counted with final scoring is simply just all of the sparks that you have collected throughout the game. This is going to probably be a lot of what your score is, um, actually depending on the types 
types of cards that you have in play. Um, but you're going to have some sparks from throughout the game. You are also then going to gain one spark per card in your city. So if you have a lot of cards at the end in your city, then you will get more sparks for those. And then lastly, for final scoring, if you have some citizen cards in your game that have end game scoring, each player that has those in their city are going to count up their score for those. Um, this one here is actually a little bit unfortunate because you lose the sparks for having these in your city. So these are the type of cards, the outcast, that you want to, you know, get rid of, to discard, to give to other players. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the different abilities for all of these 30 different types of citizens, but just know there are a ton of different kind of ways that these cards work. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, some of them affect other players, some of them only affect you. Um, I am going to quickly kind of give you a brief overview of some of the ones that I have here in the game so you guys can get a feel for some of the available abilities. Um, but depending on your level of the scientist, you are going to gain victory points. So you are going to gain seven if it's a level one, 10 if it's a level two, and 15 if it's a level three. And then it allows you to discard one card from your city. So I would activate this action and I would actually be able to discard this outcast, which is something that I would want to do. Um, so that is the scientist. We also have the warrior here that is gain a certain amount of sparks if you have more military icons than a neighbor's city. So if this is a level one, I'd gain six victory points, level two, 10, and level three, 14. Um, and this would just be looking at one uh, or the other neighbor. So that's that. The bandit here is actually an attack ability. So this is take a certain amount of victory points based off of your level for each opponent whose city has more economics icons than your city. Um, and then I've already kind of explained the outcast, but it says lose a certain amount of victory points based on the amount of cards that you have in your city at the end of the game. So this is an end game kind of thing. If you only have one outcast, you're gonna lose one spark per two cards. If you have two of these outcasts for level two, you're going to lose one victory point per card. And if you have three of these outcasts in your city, you are going to lose two sparks per card that you have in your city. So it's best to have less of these outcast cards in your city at the end of the game. Um, and yeah, there's a bunch of different ones here. The advisor here has a uh, reaction ability. So if someone attacks them, they will then actually gain two sparks. Um, and then they have an end game ability here that depending on how many advisors they have in their city, they will either gain six, 12 or 20 victory points. So if you can manage to get three advisors into your city by the end of the game, that is 20 victory points there. So that's pretty good. Um, and then lastly, the only other one that I see here is the champion. So this is gain a certain amount of victory points in one neighbor's city. So this is based off of their military icons. So I'd gain one spark per military, two spark per military, or three spark per military based off of the uh, level of this. And I think that is pretty much everything. Just a little bit of an overview of some of the abilities and things that are available with these citizens. Like I said, there are 30 different cards and different citizens to choose from and mix and match. So the variability of the different kind of games that you're going to have with this is pretty large. So anyways, like I was saying before, whoever at the end of the game has the most sparks will be the winner. And I do think that that is going to be everything for this preview of Citizens of the Spark. All right, friends. So that is going to be everything for today's video and this preview of Citizens of the Spark. A huge thank you again to Thunderworks Games for sponsoring Answering today's video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. If you did, please give this video a big thumbs up. Also hit the subscribe button down below if you've yet to do so. We'd love to have you here in the garden. Like I said before, I will have a link to the campaign down in the description box. If this sounds like something that you would enjoy and you're interested in backing, definitely go and check out the campaign. Um, but yeah, I love you guys so, so much. Remember, you are somebody's reason to smile and I will see you in the next board game video. Bye friends.